why do so many people go with these false prophets? They feel empty and misunderstood in mainstream medicine. And we are not very good, or let's say you're not very good, um, <laughs> in saying, let's see how well that works, what this guru is telling people. <laughs> In a world in which over half of all diagnoses are wrong, should we find new ways of understanding illness that are more holistic, individual, and include things like lifestyle, mental, and spiritual health? Gina, could you kick us off on this question? Um, yeah, well, the short answer is yes. <laughs> that was quick. Um, but I think medicine has for too long ignored the idea that what goes on in the outside world, a bit like the rock or whatever, has a big impact and people's uh, lifestyles and their lived experiences has a major impact. Even if medicine still wants to stick with there must be a physical problem, they're ignoring the fact what we social cognitive neuroscientists have been showing is that there are major brain changing events in the outside world. Um, one of the areas I've been looking at with reference to understanding uh, differences in autism is actually bullying um, and seeing, tracking how Individuals who've experienced bullying, of which sadly a high number of autistic individuals suffer that, you can see how the brain has been changed by that and that then impacts on how they behave. So medicine might just look at the you know, changed brain and say, oh, there's some kind of genetic factor here um, and not actually ask the questions about is there anything else in this person's external experiences which, which might bring about those kind of problems. So I think that, that, that would be a key issue. How do you respond to that, Bethel? Uh, there's some very elementary things have not been looked at. I'm thinking about um, simple things like touch. Uh, Ashley Montague, another Brit. Uh, the Brits are some of the most untouched people in the world. Uh, so he wrote a book about touch. That's what you do when you don't know about something. Um, fantastic book. There's basically no research on the power of touch to affect the immune system. So because my book is doing so well, we now have a foundation and we studied, we actually funded a study where people can study the role of touch. Huge issue in medicine. You know, whether you get touched or not by a nurse or whether you're left by yourself on a monitor may just make a gigantic difference. So some of the most elementary things we don't even know about. Again, how the Brits knew about attachment. John Bowlby showed that a mom staying in the room with her kid has a spectacular uh, effect on the outcome of the illness of their child. And so now in pediatrics, parents are allowed to be in the same room with their kids, which didn't happen before. Huh? So what difference does it make to have somebody who you feel cared for in your room and touching you versus being in a room with monitors? I sometimes go to a hospital and day and night the, the monitors go off, the, the paging system go off, and you cannot even sleep because we're focused on the chemistry and we're not focused on how this creature is doing while, while they're being sick. I think being in ICU for most people is a traumatic experience. Day and night you get stimulated and your brain doesn't get a rest. And so there's very elementary things that don't get looked at at this point because they're so focused on technology. Yeah. How does that sit with you, John? Would you agree that we need to look at the environment of a hospital in much greater detail? I, I'm very much in favor of looking at everything. Uh, so uh, that could be social, community, environment, uh, conditions, preconditioning. Uh, example of, of touch is, is very nice. But for all of that, I, I think it's important to stick to studying it rigorously. Uh, you know, not just say, oh, that's such a wonderful okay, idea. You see. That's like, when I say things like what I say, you say you study it rigorously. You know what I do? I study things rigorously. I am a <laughs> professor at Harvard and now at Boston University. So don't say, oh, you know, you're not rigorous. <laughs> no, you should well, study the right subject rigorously. <laughs> so, so by that I mean that uh, they have to be subjected to experimental testing Absolutely. whenever it's possible. Uh, Absolutely. With rigorous uh, ways and uh, also make sure that they do make a difference. And, and the question then becomes also, they make a difference for what? Because if, uh, you know, touch I think is very important. Uh, do I want it to make a difference in like immune response? Uh, you know, measuring interleukin levels and what? say that interleukin 15 was elevated after you touched me? I wouldn't care less. Hmm? Uh, I feel well when I'm touched uh, for, for many reasons. 
uh, we need to find why and what is exactly that That's we right. need to measure. Exactly. And, and what is really important about that phenomenon and, and what do we really need? And to, to do that, you need to ask people. You need to ask healthy people and you need to ask patients also. Uh, patients may have a very different perspective about what matters to them compared to the researcher or to, to the expert. Uh, healthy people may have their own priorities and I, I think this is always something that we need to discuss with them and see why are we doing all of that? You know, what, what is our goal? What are we trying to achieve? In what ways are we trying to improve our lives? Uh, just adding diagnosis to you that uh, you know you have this and this and this and that. I mean, I, I'm a researcher, so I can make all of you be sick tonight. It's very easy. Uh, that's not a, a good goal, isn't it? I mean, uh, I, I want to make you feel better, not that, oh goodness, I need to see 20 specialists tomorrow morning because I'm sick with 25 diseases. What are some of the modalities you're worried are not being studied rigorously enough? Uh, almost nothing is studied vigorously. <laughs> so I, I think this applies both to like the traditional interventions that come through the pipeline of, uh, let's say, mechanistic thinking, a uh, reductionist approach, you know, one molecule, one gene or one target, and then we develop uh, a biologic or a drug and we, we try to move it to the market. We know that there's zillions of problems in that pipeline in terms of biases, in terms of setting the agenda instead of, uh, of regulatory agencies really paying uh, their dues to the industry very often and uh, uh, you know, not recognizing harms as uh, properly as we should recognize them. So there's lots of problems there. Now, once you move to lifestyle, oh goodness, like, like almost all the literature on, on lifestyle, even though it is so important, is unreliable. If you move to holistic medicine, it's in the border zone of science and pseudoscience at the moment, N not because holistic views are, are not important, but, but because we, we are mostly in the regime of uh, like John Yanid is the guru saying that this is the holistic view of, of, of mental health or, or of uh, uh, integrating your, your, your being. And you know, I, I, I've just seen so much nonsense there that could have been avoided if we had just stuck to some very baseline type of uh, assessment and, and testing. Maybe we can gain a lot from that. Uh, I think that there's plenty to be gained, but, but until we have that, I, I'm, I'm very, very skeptical. I'm more skeptical than I am for uh, the very traditional mechanistic type of interventions, which have their problems. Battle, how does that sit uh, with you? you know, I, I live in your world, so I know the arguments you make, and they're valid. And I also got irritated, including at this conference, about how many people express feelings and emotions without any data. And I'm a data guy. Uh, on the other hand, why do so many people go with these false prophets? They, they, because they feel empty and misunderstood in mainstream medicine. And we are not very good, or let's say you're not very good, um, <laughs> It's <laughs> a, let's see how well that works, what this guru is telling people. Uh, there's this gigantic, you know, people spend, probably spend as much money on alternative medicine as on mainstream medicine. There's a reason for that, because let's say we, this, uh, we fail people. So they go somewhere else, and we're not particularly eager in helping the world to understand what might or might not be helpful about these other methods. So I would advocate being much more curious from a scientific point of view is what do these people or these methods have to offer? And what but, but bothers me in, in my world also is how many of my colleagues who are into the trauma field just say things without evidence. Uh, so how can we create young professionals who say, I cannot just say things, I also need to actually prove it. And I think, how do we change the, the culture of professionalism where you actually evaluate all of your results at all times, certainly in psychology and psychiatry, that almost never happens. Huh? And so I'm very much with you in, yes, we need the evidence, but then we also should promote the gathering of the evidence, which we're not doing. Yeah. Let's pick up a bit on what I think is um, playing out here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, is the idea that psychological medicine has got a big image problem. Um, I had a colleague, high-ranking scientist, who suffered very badly from long COVID and was hoping to get some help. And 
outraged email saying, I've just got an appointment with the Department of Psychological Medicine. Do they think it's all in the mind? So the, the idea that somehow that's a pejorative term, um, which I'm kind of picking up a bit on here. Um, and it's interesting, I noticed that when those are dismissed, they're often referred to as touchy-feely. So maybe that's another issue. Um, but I, I think that's where medicine has said that it has to be something in the body. Um, and in, in, in autism, for example, there have been conditions in the past which have been part of the autism diagnosis schedule. And then it's been discovered there's a genetic origin and proudly almost it's taken out of the psychological schedule and put in the physical condition schedule. So I think there's sometimes an issue where people don't realise that actually, I won't get into the mind-brain argument <laughs> just yet, our brains have, can be changed hugely and there is this big two-way interaction between the world, which I think medicine ignores. I'm totally with you on that. You know, when we look at longitudinal studies of high-risk populations, of which there are about four or five now, what you see is that if you focus on the biology very early on in these kids' lives, it has some impact on the lifelong course, but that the relationships of security and social support at the end have a gigantic impact on the expression of those genes. And so the whole issue of epigenetics becomes terribly important, is how do these genes get expressed in the context of the environment? And um, we can use a lot more work on that. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll move on to the next question, which is this. If we accept that we do not know how to... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.